calculate the binding energy in MeV of a nucleus 59 cobalt 27 and we're given the mass of that nucleus here in atomic mass units we'll use. So in order to find the binding energy we need to find the mass loss as the nucleus is being formed which means we have to find whatever the mass was of the nucleus's initial components. So that will be 27 lots of the proton mass plus 32 lots which is the nucleon number minus the number of protons times the neutron's mass. So that's going to be 27 times, this is proton, so it's this figure here, 1.00728 plus 32 times the neutron mass, which is this one here in a mass units, of course, which is going to be 1.00867. Now, if you work that lot out, you get 59.474 atomic mass units. So that means that the change of mass is going to be 59.474 take away the final mass of the nucleus which is 58.93320 and of course this is going to be in use and again when you do that you will get 0.5408 atomic mass units. Now all that remains to be done is to convert that into energy. And we're given the conversion factor up here where it tells us that 1U is equal to 931.5 mega electron volts. Therefore, our energy or the binding energy is going to be equal to the mass difference, 5408, multiplied by 931.5 MeV. And when you perform that calculation, you get 503.8 MeV. In part B, we are asked to consider the energy change of an iron-59 nucleus as it decays into cobalt. Now, the, the decay takes place by the emission of a beta particle, followed by the emission of a gamma ray. So there is an in-between state when the cobalt-59 nucleus is excited, as represented here. It's still cobalt-59, though. It's just excited, cobalt-59. And just like with electron levels, these excited levels of the nucleus of cobalt can decay by emitting gamma rays and that's what's described in the second part of the question here but in the first part of the process what we have is the iron nucleus decaying by emitting two things a beta particle and a anti-electron neutrino and the combination of these two particles the beta particle and the neutrino can carry off different amounts of energy giving us three possible energy states for the cobalt-59 after the initial decay. And that's what's represented by the three levels that we've already mentioned on the right. Now in this question, we've been asked to consider what is the maximum possible energy that the electron can have as it is emitted from the iron-59 nucleus. Now there's a couple of things to think about here. Firstly, we have to realize that the neutrino is gonna carry away some of the energy. So we're gonna assume that in fact, it isn't gonna carry away any of the energy and the beta particle is gonna get it all. And secondly, we're asked to find the maximum drop. So if we consider that our iron nucleus starts at 2.52 times 10 to the minus 13 joules, like this, then the biggest drop is going to be from that top level to the level 1.76. So that is when the electron is going to carry away the most energy. So let's take a look now at how to work out how much energy that actually is. Well, the iron begins at 2.52 times 10 to the minus 13 joules, becomes a cobalt, but the excited cobalt at the state of 1.76 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So if we take those two numbers away, that will be the amount of energy shared between the beta particle and the neutrino, but we're assuming the beta particle gets all of it. And that corresponds to 0.76 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So now it's just a question of converting this energy in joules into MeV. So then you could just take 0.76 times 10 to the minus 13 and divide it by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. If you do that, you will get the answer of 0.48 MeV. And just to say, you might find yourself actually dividing the uh, 0.76 times 10 to the minus 13 by 1.6 
times 10 to the minus 13 instead of minus 19, in which case the answer will straight away come out in mega electron volts. If you did it my way, you then have to take account of converting your answer from electron volts into mega electron volts. In part C then, we're asked to consider how many possible discrete gamma ray wavelengths or frequencies that we can obtain as this nucleus decays. So going down from the three levels to the ground state, we will get these three possibilities. Then going down to the 1.76 from the other levels, we would have these two possibilities. And then going down from the, the levels to the 2.06, there is in fact only one. So that means that the total number of discrete gamma rays is going to be six. So now we've been asked to find the longest wavelength of emitted gamma radiation. So longest wavelength means shortest frequency, which means least energy, because frequency and energy are proportional. Therefore, we're looking for the change which occurs, which is the smallest drop, which is going to be these two. So the energy change is going to be 2.29, take away 2.06, of course, times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So we know that the energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. We also know that C equals F lambda, and that implies, of course, that frequency is C over lambda. And substituting those back into the first formula, then we get that the energy is equal to Planck's constant times C over lambda. And ultimately, we're after lambda. So let's just rearrange for lambda then. Lambda equals HC over E. Now it's just a question of bunging in the numbers. And very helpfully, I've written Planck's constant up there already. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times 3 times 10 to the 8, all divided by 2.29 minus 2.06, all times 10 to the minus 13. And when you work out that lovely lot, you get 8.6 times 10 to the minus 12 metres.